the first pearl. Who am I? You will know who you are when you see who you are not. We think we know all there is to know about ourselves. You may believe that you're the reliable one, the optimistic one, or the melancholy one. You've probably decided you're either an introvert or the life of the party. Sometimes we experience a disturbance of some kind in our lives, a trauma or a loss. Seeing ourselves in action during a crisis, we're sometimes shocked. It could be that we've never imagined we could be so strong. Or maybe we're weaker than we expected, or more fearful. There comes a time in most of our lives when we're ready to admit we are not who we thought we were. In such cases, it could be that the values we defend aren't reflected in our actions. We're in conflict with people around us. Our minds are in conflict with our hearts. We blame or we lash out. We shout at our kids. We insult a friend. Where did that come from? We ask ourselves. Confused and discouraged, we begin to wonder what makes us do the things we do. We wanted the truth but seem to have missed something in our search. Asking yourself, who am I, means taking the first step back to authenticity or truth. Our instinct is to cling to the picture we have of ourselves, which makes any new discoveries impossible. Questioning who we are gives us a chance to bring down a few walls, a few stubborn beliefs, and reconnect with life. Most of the stories about who you are come from things your parents told you, what you like, what you dislike, or what you're good at. You heard more opinions from brothers, sisters, and childhood friends. As you grew up, you got descriptions of yourself from everyone you met. You're the smart one, they might have said. You're the rebel. Or, my, you're just like your father. People still like to imagine you in their own way. You're so stubborn. You don't know how to love. You never take risks. By now, you've formed a solid opinion of yourself. But consider what this opinion is based on. Since you were born, you've heard different people describe you in many different ways. They each see what they want to see. And you've supplemented other people's stories with stories of your own. When you meet someone, you talk about your life, past events and hopes for the future. You tell the same stories, more or less the same way, featuring yourself as the main character. How did that character come to define you? Let's first look at how we tell our story. And then we can see how the main character describes itself and drives all our actions. We are storytelling creatures. Telling a story is a good way to connect to other people. Most of us don't think of ourselves as weavers of myth, but we never stop telling the story of our lives. We recount the events of each day as they unfold for anyone who will listen. We tell stories to ourselves as if to explain what we've already experienced. We talk nostalgically about yesterday and speculate about tomorrow. Some stories we tell often, inventing dramatic interpretations and new plot twists. And why not? Telling stories is what humans do. You probably don't put faith in fairy tales anymore but you believe the story of your life. Most of us put a lot of faith in our version of reality. We talk about the events of our lives reverently, describing them in careful detail. We put on a performance for an audience of one, or many. If we stopped to listen to ourselves, we'd also realise how masterfully we play with emotions. If we took the time to write down the story of our lives, highlighting its most important moments, we'd see how easy it is to fall into our own emotional traps. 
However, if we wrote it all down a second time and a third, those moments would eventually lose their power to move us. We would begin to see just how much we are shaping our story to emphasize the drama. Even the best stories lose their emotional impact after the first telling. When we're finally able to disarm the emotional triggers in our own story, we can recall any event without the usual self-pity or self-importance. We can talk about today's problems and yesterday's mishaps without the need for sympathy. If we ever read our story out loud, we'd begin to see it all as a work of fiction, a work of art. And we'd realize that even our best stories don't tell the truth about us. So if that's the case, then who are we? As the old man in our little parable suggested, we'd be wise to first take a look at what we are not. The voice of me. Ever since you can remember, you've given the main character of your story power to determine your reality. It has the authority to talk, think, and make decisions that affect your body and your world. It tells you what to believe and how to invest your beliefs with emotional energy. You call the main character in your ongoing story, me. Let's take a minute to understand what the word me means in this context. Me is the person you accept as your real self. You talk about yourself all the time, right? You say me, mine, and myself countless times in the course of an ordinary conversation. Through me, you say things like, hey, this is important to me, or are you listening to me, or what are they saying about me? Me is everything you believe you are. Me is everything related to the character you forged out of the core beliefs and countless experiences. The word me, or its counterpart in any language, is a simple pronoun. And like every word in the language we speak, it has no meaning until we agree upon a meaning. The difference is that me comes with a lot of baggage, past memories, judgments, and automatic assumptions. We put a lot of faith in our identity and expect it to matter to other people. Who we think we are develops into a mythology. We share the myth of me with old friends and new acquaintances. We tell riveting stories about ourselves. We send photos to back up our stories. We celebrate me in so many ways. Me always refers to the person speaking, but we don't give much consideration to who that might be. We say, look at me, indicating that we want attention given to this human being, but also to this thought process, these frustrations, these expectations. We feel sympathy for ourselves, but to the one listening, look at me, could evoke some other emotions. Our idea of who we are isn't everyone's idea of who we are. It may not be anyone's idea. Me doesn't refer to the body we occupy. Me doesn't describe the energy that moves through us. Me isn't a primal thing. Because we didn't invent a self until we learned a language. Me didn't exist until we began to see the world through symbols and their meanings. In short, me doesn't refer to anything real. It refers to an image, an idea we have of ourselves that we've attempted to put into words. Of course, the words we use to describe ourselves change all the time, because we see things differently with every changing situation. Who we think we are has evolved a lot since early childhood, when we first began to talk and think. Who we imagine ourselves to be still changes with time, with shifting moods, and with the feedback we get from people we care about. 
our impressions change, but we each subscribe to a general myth or false belief about ourselves. Me is a personal mythology, a collection of stories that we repeat to ourselves and accept as truth. Like children with their superheroes, we are believers in me. Wrapped in our mythology, we feel confident to take on the world. Me is not what you actually are. You are life, or the energy that made you a physical being. Life runs through your body and makes it able to move, to love, to feel. Life's energy created your miraculous brain. It made a thinking mind possible and gave voice to its main character. Life is everything seen and unseen. Only life exists. There is only life and infinite points of view. Everything created by life has a point of view and your body is one. Your mind is one. The human body develops according to its biological programming, but the mind evolves consciously through attention and deliberate action. The mind is what we think we are until we decide otherwise. The voice that speaks for the mind is us until we recognize that it's not the truth of us at all. Of all the things we can accomplish as humans, this kind of self-awareness brings the most rewards. It can guide the evolution of the main character. Me responds to your name and knows your history. Me is aware of your physical environment. And me can also become aware of itself. Personal growth does get complicated when we try to distance ourselves from the character we created. Through me, we describe ourselves and the world. If we claim to be the victim of the voice in our head, we'll be the victim in all situations. If we deny the power we have to change the voice of me, how can new doors of awareness ever open? How can we live fearlessly within the dream of humanity, where there are more than seven billion me's, all with opinions of their own and all demanding to be heard? Reality is everyone's personal creation, so the same is true of your reality. The judgments in your head are the result of your beliefs and past experiences. If you feel oppressed by your own thoughts, then it's time to take charge of them. Does me have to be a big judge or a constant victim? No. Most of us want a closer relationship with the truth, and we all want some peace of mind. We want to be healthy, but so often our judgments make us sick. We want to be spiritually aware, but our beliefs keep us spellbound. If we take the time to listen to what we think and say, we have a chance to be more honest with ourselves. Behavior follows belief, and any belief can be modified. If we challenge our own opinions, we can begin to find our way back to authenticity. Do we always have to be right? Do we really need to have the last word? If our actions do not represent the kind of people we want to be, we can take new paths of action. We can change. It makes sense that the more we invest in our own self-image, the more difficult it is to change. So we shouldn't use the main character of our story as an excuse to feel victimized or to deceive ourselves. The truth can speak through the mind just as it moves through nerves and flesh. The mind can choose to serve truth and not the stories. Life's energy uses the tools available to create a body, a thought or a dream. A healthy body is a wonderful conduit for energy and an aware mind is a secret to making our reality work for us. Your body is real, but me is fictional. And yet me is running the show. 
How many times have you defended your actions and not understood why? At times we will regret doing things we consider inexcusable or saying things we don't really mean. We like to say, I'm only human. But it's not our humanness that's causing the problem. So it's natural to wonder who really is in charge. Who am I? We wonder, not really expecting an answer. No one stops to ask who they're not. And that's where we have to begin. Be aware of yourself as energy and everything changes. Here is how that works. You are no longer the victim of your beliefs. You are the creator. You are the artist. You are also the painting, the canvas that is your reality. Imagine picking up a brush and painting a figure that looks like you. Imagine doing that continually for the rest of your life. Unlike most figures in a painting, however, this one has a brain. It has a brain with a mind that gives meaning to what it perceives. It functions beautifully, but it's not aware that there is an artist. There are many other figures in this painting, but they're also not aware of the artist. This makes it inevitable that they rely on each other for knowledge. They react and interact with each other. They learn from each other. Every day the scenario changes. Instant by instant there are subtle changes happening to the painter's main point of focus. The figure itself is coming alive at your touch. You not only have the colours and brushes to work with, but you can make choices through this character. You can work as life works, providing constant opportunity for growth, so that the main figure adapts well to an ever-changing landscape. You can skillfully guide me into awareness. Some people dare to look inward. They take the time to listen to their own thoughts and reflect on their own actions. They ask questions of themselves. Am I really this kind of person? Are these feelings genuine? If I'd known I had a choice, would I have done it the same way? They catch themselves in mid-reaction and change the response. They find emotional balance. That's what it means to be present. That's how we become healthier in mind and spirit. By observing, we can all learn. By modifying the voice in our heads, we have a chance to grow wise. Some people stop believing their thoughts altogether. This is important because once the voice in our head loses authority, it turns silent. We can observe events and respond genuinely. We're used to reacting in expected ways. We're used to seeing things as we've been taught to see them and as we've preferred to see them. Once we stop lying to ourselves, all that is left is truth. All that is left is authenticity, something we lost in our storytelling. Throughout human history, people have been wondering, questioning, seeking. Some of those people have changed the world, not just their world, but the entire dream of humanity. They begin by doubting what they know. They ask one question, then another. They consult wiser men and women, perhaps. Soon, they start listening to the main character of their own story. It has a voice that speaks clearly, and only to them. What is it saying, and how much of its message is true? Can any of it be believed? For that matter, what is the truth? What is real? We have a few amazing tools to work with when it comes to solving the mystery of who we are. The first tool is the power of attention. 
Our attention is what makes it possible to take notice and to learn. The sound of our name captures our attention, a response we learned in infancy. Attention brings every other faculty into play. We look, we listen, we respond. We receive information and we process it. And by catching another person's attention, we learn to transmit information to someone else and out to the world. Over time, however, we've mastered the art of sleepwalking through life. We don't think we need to pay attention because we're sure we know what's going on around us. Our responses to everything have become predictable. Our thinking is automatic and we automatically assume we know what other people are thinking. It's safe to say that our attention has been weakened by neglect. What if we rediscovered its amazing power. We'd have minds that are agile and flexible when events change, and change is inevitable. There's no need ever to be crushed by failed expectations. If we used our senses to gather real information, we wouldn't be so mystified by life. If we really listened, not only to what people are saying, but also to what we say to ourselves in quiet moments, we would empathize with others so much more and show compassion toward ourselves. Instead, we make assumptions and encourage misunderstanding. Strengthening our attention may feel like a workout at first, but the rewards come quickly. The brain responds eagerly to new challenges. Look, listen and observe without judgment. Notice how your emotional responses become more honest without a story. Attention can lead to total awareness in every precious moment of life. The second tool is memory. Memory is stored in matter, our brains, the way music is stored on a compact disc. We're able to store all of the memories of a lifetime in one brain, but that doesn't make those memories real. We store impressions of things, of people and events. But since every brain perceives in its own way, even siblings remember childhood events differently. Memory helps to create an impression of reality, but impressions aren't the same as truth. We rely too much on memory to tell us the truth. We let it turn our attention away from the present moment and draw us into the past. We frequently use memory against ourselves, but we have the power to use it differently. Instead, we can let memory enlighten us. Just as memory played a key role in our early development, it can guide us in our adult transformation. In infancy, we watched our parents, we listened and we imitated. Everything we observed became part of our own pattern of behavior. We tried to walk, we fell down, and we tried again. We learned to avoid pain and move toward pleasure. And what about now, when we wish to change some unpleasant patterns? Why wouldn't we do everything we can to take care of our physical body and our emotional well-being? We know how it feels to lose our temper and feel regret. It feels awful. We know how shame and guilt make us feel, and yet we still invite them in. Memory can serve us in our efforts to wake up and to resist automatic responses. Memory can steer us away from abusive habits, encouraging us to stand up and walk forward with self-respect. And the third and best tool is imagination. Imagination is its own kind of superpower. We picture something in our minds and then we make it real. In fact, just by imagining something wonderful, the body feels comforted and energized. We can also imagine painful events and horrible consequences. By imagining the worst, we produce fear in the physical body and spread fear to the other bodies. We imagine the future and tune out the present. Imagination is power, 
for sure, but like all power, it can be corrupted. Right now we can practice using imagination in a valuable way. We can turn our attention to the exciting task of making ourselves more aware. We can use memory the way it was intended to be used, to keep us from repeating past mistakes. We can imagine things we've never tried to imagine. We can doubt what we know and let go of familiar stories. The mind wields enormous influence. It has developed habits over time, but we can change those habits. By using the tools available to us, we can calm the inner chaos and find peace in our virtual world. You are not who you think you are. In obvious ways, you're not the kid you were at four years old, struggling with unspoken fears. You're not the awkward teenager, the rookie at work, or the young entrepreneur. You're not someone's significant other or your mum's favourite child. You're not the main character of your story, or anyone else's, regardless of how long you've played those roles. And you're not actually the one you call me, who tries to speak for your physical body. You're not your mind or the set of laws your mind tries so hard to enforce. It has created an entire governing force out of those laws, but that's not what you are either. You're not really the little government in your head, but its laws nonetheless influence your actions and reactions. Sometimes that government seems tolerant, sometimes it's blind and unforgiving. Either way, me is operating as its commander-in-chief. Now would be a good time to decide what kind of leader me should be. Now is a good time to take a look at your creation and to make inspired changes. We were all born to learn, to grow and to become aware human beings. It was our intention to be the best we could be. Somewhere along the way, we got distracted. Our intentions were derailed. We forgot what it felt like to be authentic. It may seem impossible to escape from our own system of punishments and rewards, but that's not true. We can bring down the whole structure if we want to. It's interesting to see how each of us creates a personal reality. It's also interesting to see just how far we go to defend that reality. Rather than defend it, we can make it better. It takes a few basic insights to pull off a revolution. First, it's important to see how the system was put into place. It's helpful to see how we got here, wherever we are, and what we can do to change our world. We can explore ways to transform the one that's describing that world to us. Awareness is the ability to see what is, and it's never too late to open your eyes. One mind, one community. To understand the governing mind a little better, let's first take another look at the ways in which we've been governed throughout our lives. We were each born into a vast community called humanity. Over many thousands of years, humans have created groups or civilizations all over the planet. We create groups in order to survive. We agree on certain rules written laws or ritual customs, so that order can be maintained within these groups. We establish governing bodies made up of respected men and women. We create cities and nations, all run by their own government. Each nation is made of smaller governing bodies, and it all starts with the family. A family is its own little nation, traditionally composed of a man, a woman, and their children. A family cannot be defined any one way, of course. A family is formed when people of different genders and ages come together in order to provide for the welfare and safety of the group. The group may consist of two people, a dozen people, or many more. Together they create a home which is an extension of themselves. Every family is regulated by its own government. 
families establish rules of conduct, rules that help maintain harmony within the group. Work hard. Look after each other. Respect your elders. They also devise punishments for breaking those rules. The head of a family makes key decisions, setting the rules and enforcing them. One parent may yield authority to the other, or both parents may share power equally, forming a government within the family. You and I were born to different families and grew up in different households. The rules were probably different, along with penalties for bad behaviour, but we were both domesticated using a system of punishments and rewards. From the time we were toddlers, we learned there was a price to pay for rebellion. Whoever served as the head of the family imposed the rules, using the power of authority. Of course, those in charge had other ways of persuading us. They might have applied physical punishments or psychological abuses. Sometimes all it took was the subtle power of suggestion. Using our own imaginations to control us, our parents often told stories about naughty kids getting what they deserved. You'd better watch out. They cautioned us using Santa Claus, the bogeyman, or dead saints to make their point. Parents tell stories to manage their children. To discipline unruly children, they intimidate. They keep them from danger. They use whatever means they think is appropriate. Parents themselves are ruled by the strict lessons of their childhood. No one is above the law. Groups of families create communities, the next level of government. A community like a family is dedicated to the welfare of the whole. Every community has a leader, just as every family does, and that leader makes the rules regarding acceptable modes of behaviour. Everyone in the community agrees to follow the rules, knowing they will receive some kind of punishment if they don't. When communities create alliances with other communities, cities are established. In a city, there are many more people who want to lead. The competition gets fierce, and governing becomes more arduous. Every city must choose a mayor and a legislature made up of dedicated citizens. Together they decide on the rules of acceptable conduct and on various ways of enforcing those rules. Cities are ruled by their individual governments and no one person, not even the mayor, is above the law. When cities develop partnerships with other cities, a province or state is formed. Every state has its own government, which has its own governor and system of laws. Choosing leaders gets more complicated as societies get larger. Citizens find it harder to be active participants in their own fate. Governors administer justice according to state laws and enforce those laws through whatever force is available to them. No one, at least in theory, is above the law. States ultimately form a confederacy called a country or a nation. Now the stakes are high for everyone. Different kind of government leaders compete to rule the entire country. Once in office, they use the power of their authority and direct available forces to impose their rules. Enforcement doesn't always mean imprisonment or corporeal punishment. Governors may also use fear and imagination to manage their constituents. Like their parents once did, they might use threats, guilt and shame. They may simply use little suggestions to influence people. By whatever means they enforce the law and they often find that they are not above the laws they've put in place. A leader of one nation may desire to rule another nation as well. This is how civilizations evolve, as societies become more complex and leaders expand their authority. Nations form bigger nations and impose their laws on more communities and families. In some cases, nations lose their power and get swallowed up. Maps are drawn and redrawn. Rules still continue to be made and enforced with whatever means are available. It's worthwhile to remember how outside governance has played a continuing role in our lives. It's worthwhile because our personal reality reflects the ways we use the same governing methods to discipline ourselves. We've been taught to respond to traffic lights, signals and sirens, because by not responding we risk paying a penalty. 
We don't ignore tax deadlines or no trespassing signs for the same reason. In any country, life goes more smoothly when we don't challenge local laws. Challenging our own mental directives is another matter. Thinking that harsh judgment is somehow virtuous, we impose rules and sanctions on ourselves, rarely stopping to wonder why. Would it hurt if we relaxed our control a little? What price would we pay for being kinder to ourselves? We grew up under the influence of one governing institution after another. We all learned by observing, listening and imitating. So it follows that we've devised a way to police our own happiness. We are afraid to lose control. We want to control other people without considering their freedoms or showing them basic respect. Too often, our system of governing gets in the way of our basic desire to communicate and to love. It's not surprising that our principles, the ones taught to us by our family and our culture, often suppress us and put limits on our joy. Imitating them, we write our own constitution and execute our own punishments. We disparage ourselves, attack ourselves and suffer the emotional pain. For reasons most of us have forgotten, we insist on denying our bodies basic pleasures. We often force ourselves to do what we don't enjoy. And we, sometimes literally, send ourselves to bed without supper. In the personal reality we've created, no one is above the law. Not even us. Imposing our will on other people only pushes them away. Our laws aren't real. Our little government only illustrates who we are not. We're not lawmakers doomed to enforce rules at the expense of our own happiness. Our minds and bodies are meant to be allies in the quest for better relationship with life. By questioning our own rules, we can enjoy the freedom to act and react truthfully. We can start the journey back to authenticity. The mind as government. Allowing the mind to operate like a government pulls us farther from what we really are. Devising laws and punishments is a job for outside institutions. It is what societies do and even their success depends on a willingness to change what doesn't work. With all our private judgments and censures, we've each built virtual jails for ourselves and that can't possibly make us happy. Our personal reality doesn't have to be a prison. It should be an artistic effort. When we think of it as a living work of art, we can modify the masterpiece as we go. We have the power to make better choices, keeping the welfare of the body in mind. By governing ourselves with respect, we can create harmony in every facet of our lives. Of course, it helps to remind ourselves what government was designed to do. The kind of government most of us are familiar with has three main branches. A legislative, an executive and a judicial branch. All three have the overriding purpose of serving the welfare of the country. A system of checks and balances makes sure one branch of the government doesn't act in ways that undermine the others. Our mind can work in the same way, by checking the integrity of its own actions. Each branch needs to be accountable and transparent. The mind needs to be aware of itself and practice effective oversight. The legislative branch of any government is called Congress. Congress makes laws and ratifies treaties and so does the human mind. The mind creates strict laws, not just those handed down by family and society, but its own laws. These laws, whether consciously or unconsciously made, govern how we live. They're the self-reprimands and resolutions that guide our behavior. They also include our prejudices and phobias. You abide by the laws of your mind and your mind expects others to abide by its own laws as well. You abide by the laws of your mind, and your mind expects others 
to abide by its laws as well. As you may have noticed, you get along better with people who respect your laws and accept your views. Take a moment to consider how much importance you give to your rules and principles. It doesn't matter if they echo the principles of your parents or grandparents, because they're yours now. You may be able to state them clearly, and you may find fault with people who don't agree with those principles. You may even try to convince family members and friends to follow them. If they disagree, you might get angry. You might even pick a fight. As it turns out, most relationship problems have to do with your government wanting to be right and deciding that every other government is wrong. Defending your own constitution, you often declare war on other nations and their people. Most people declare a thousand little wars over a lifetime, fighting every criticism and rival opinion. You get the sense that you're not being respected, so you become disrespectful. All of this inhibits your natural inclination to love and be generous. Your Congress has overruled your authenticity, which means your government has defeated its true purpose. We lose our sense of fairness and empathy when our personal laws take on too much importance. It's nice to have a code of behaviour to live by, but that code should not have a negative impact on our relationships. We may not even recognise certain ideas as principles, but the character called me still uses them to legislate and to prosecute. It uses them to scold other people and to quarrel with itself. Understanding our own actions and reactions makes a change in our internal government possible. Understanding our own actions and reactions makes a change in our internal government possible. Think about the ideas that define you, ideas that tell the world who you are. You're an activist or a volunteer. You're a workaholic. You're a liberal or a conservative. You're loyal to a fault. You're God-fearing, patriotic, and the number one fan of your home team. These may seem like admirable ways to describe yourself, but have they made your life any easier? How much time do you spend explaining and defending your position? Do you criticise people who describe themselves differently? Do you lay down the law to your family and friends, expecting them to be as fanatical as you are? You may still want to start a war, or just win a few battles. Either way, opinions are not where your power lies. They're just opinions. A good argument is still just an argument. Your beliefs and ideologies may feel as if they are the heart and soul of you, but they are not. Cherished ideas represent a way of thinking that makes us feel safe, and possibly even superior. We invest them with a lot of emotional power, but they have no power of their own. Ideas and ideologies influence the way we conduct ourselves, which often feels right, but they can also harm our ability to interact and share time with others. Think about your beliefs. Are they more important than the truth of you? Are they more precious than love? To respect someone's right to an opinion is an act of love. It's a gift to others to let them share their views. It's not so difficult to listen without judgement. It's not that weird to say, I don't know, and disarm the moment. Let others know they have a valid point. We don't always have to be right. We don't ever have to be me. Most of the battles we fight are in our heads. We grapple with ideas and constantly struggle with notions of right and wrong. And then we take the fight outside, arguing about truth and lies, good and evil. Our way is brilliant, their way is stupid. Like most conflicts between nations, our wars with other people are public declarations of self-importance. We have a tendency to defend the main character of our story, often as if we are defending human life. 
Consider that for a moment. We're defending the integrity of something that isn't real. Maybe we're afraid of losing face, and that reveals the whole problem. We will lose our masks, in other words. We will abandon pretense. Unable to support what we are not, we will stand naked and authentic in front of the world, which may be what we needed all along. If we refuse to quit old habits and pretenses, how can we experience the truth of us? We will continue to be at odds with the world. We will continue to see injustice everywhere and make our lives that much more difficult. The voice of me insists that we be right and that everyone else be wrong. But where do our ideas come from in the first place? If we dare to incorporate new ideas, what exactly is at stake? Who needs to be shielded from that disturbance? If we want peace of mind, we won't find it by arguing and insisting. We find unexpected peace when we stop trying to defend the main character. Justice and the Judge Making laws is up to Congress, one branch of government. We can say that the mind acts as a legislative branch, but the mind invents ways to implement it, its laws as well. So let's turn to the second branch of self-government, the judicial. The judicial branch decides how laws should be enforced and under what circumstances. Like outside governments, our mental government demands punishing for breaking the law. We have many different ways of exacting punishments on the people around us. Our punishments may be subtle or brutal, or we may turn our anger against ourselves. How many of us have tortured ourselves for eating too much, accomplishing too little, or for just not being good enough? People run their judicial systems differently. You may be tough on yourself, but lenient with others. You might be clueless about your own crimes, but highly sensitive to the crimes of other people. You may be a loving person to others, but cruel to yourself, or the other way round. Most people are capable of cruelty if they're angry or insecure enough. Before you can make changes to your particular justice system, you need to acknowledge how it works. We all need to consider our actions. We can ask ourselves, is this response fair? Am I being respectful in this situation? Would I want to be treated in this way? Respect is a word that's impressed on us in childhood, but we were never given a chance to understand it fully. In spite of what many of us were told, no one has to earn respect. Everyone is different, but every human body is a copy of life itself. Every creature gives proof to the dance of energy and matter. That's reason enough to show respect. Respect makes it possible to see beyond someone's opinions and customs. It makes it possible to see the truth, and truth frees us from our deceptions. There's no real justice when a government is operating blindly. When the mind is reacting automatically, we make errors in judgment. We pay a high price for our assumptions, causing unnecessary suffering. If you refuse to see things as they are, we can get disappointed. We blame and we carry grudges. We show contempt for ourselves and others. How does any of this make us better human beings? How does this make us feel safer or more at peace with ourselves? Respect is a solution to injustice. Heaven, by any interpretation, is ruled by respect. We create heaven on earth by respecting ourselves and every living thing. Respect makes our interactions with other people go more smoothly. At home, in our social lives and in our business dealings, respect wins allies. We don't have to like people to show them respect. All human relationships thrive on mutual respect, whether or not we can agree on ideas. We can't give what we don't have, so respect has to begin with us. Not all of us were taught self-respect in childhood. 
we may not have been encouraged to respect our bodies and the bodies of other humans. As adults, we can now assess how kind we are to ourselves. How fair are we? How severe is our justice system, particularly when it comes to our own behaviour? Can we forgive ourselves? Do we even know how? Just as forgiveness is essential to bring healing to a country, it is also essential to a healthy mind. Throughout human history, the practice of forgiveness has turned mortal enemies into compassionate allies. This applies in our own lives as well. Forgiveness puts old grievances to rest. We often resist the impulse to forgive because we think it absolves bad people from a just punishment. Guilt or innocence is not the point. Forgiveness releases each of us from the need to hate. Forgiveness takes the past off our shoulders so we can go forward without its burden. For nations and individuals alike, the past is a corpse we shouldn't want to carry around with us. Memory should teach, not torture us. We want to be well again, happy and whole. By forgiving a trespass, we release ourselves from torment. Consider the way you use past memories to hurt yourself, time and again. There's no justice in any of it. You feel the pain over and over, and no one is affected but you. Remembering makes you miserable, and life becomes miserable for those close to you. You overlook the present moment until it, too, becomes the past. The future becomes clouded by hatred. All the real moments are lost to the moments that never existed. So, of course, you feel like you've missed something. We were all domesticated through a system of rewards and punishments. The rewards might have been positive attention for our behaviour, words of praise or gestures of affection. We might have been treated to ice cream for a job well done or allowed to spend a day playing outside with a friend. Punishment could mean a lack of response from our parents, or harsh words. Punishment might have meant getting spanked or being subjected to worse physical abuses. But it also felt like punishment to us when we were blamed for something or made to feel guilty and ashamed. As adults, we've learned to reward ourselves for our good deeds and to blame ourselves for the bad. We feel ashamed without knowing why. We submit to the kind of punishments we tolerated as children, and we offer ourselves no forgiveness. As parents sometimes do to kids, we neglect our bodies or judge them harshly. Refusing to take responsibility for the stories we tell, we blame the human body for our discomfort and pain. When we go a step farther, we invent other characters to take the blame. Having grown up believing in goblins and Santa Claus, we're used to the feeling of being watched and judged. We expect to be punished by someone for something. Why shouldn't we feel anxious and neurotic? We fear the wrath of whatever God we were taught to believe in. We want to appease angels and blame devils for the awful things we do. We watch ourselves in action, we condemn and we punish. It seems we're willing to remain immature just to avoid taking charge of our reality. By imagining ourselves as the central character in our life story, we add ourselves to a long list of childhood fictional creatures. Except me seems to be the only one who isn't taking the blame. We say things like, my bad, and I only have myself to blame. But we're not talking about the mind or the main character of our story. We're almost always blaming the human body. We judge it, and we usually find it guilty. When the main character acts like a big judge, our bodies react in fear. Me is a schoolyard bully in our world, ready to punch and intimidate. The main character of everyone's story is the rule maker, the judge and the enforcer and so the president of a very private nation. The main character of everyone's story is the rule maker, the judge and the enforcer, and also the president of a very private nation. So we need to pay attention to the way we speak through me. 
A forgiving mind is just and fair. Forgiveness creates immunities from pain. We don't have to punish ourselves for past mistakes or invent new mistakes out of our imagination. Whatever the circumstances, we are all doing our best. Tomorrow, we can do even better, but not if we're afraid of the one who is in charge of our judicial system, not if we're afraid of the judge. We all need checks and balances, which we can only exercise through self-awareness. We need to make sure our laws don't continue to harm the human being. We need to ensure that our reality is not being ruled by a lunatic. How do lunatics behave? They disrespect the human body and punish it for their own bad choices. They lie to themselves. They take everything personally. They invent conflicts and enjoy the drama. They let self-importance make decisions for them. They let fear control them. Fighting over opinions is a little insane. Insisting on having the last word is exhausting. Putting conditions on love sounds self-defeating. Still, we do crazy things like that all the time, and we suffer for it. It seems we make all kinds of excuses to suffer. Suffering is the only addiction for most of us, and we find many ways to create it. We want to be right at any cost and suffer when we're proven wrong. We suffer for our own judgments, and we continually imagine that we're being judged. We suffer for our bad habits, blaming cigarettes, drugs, or alcohol. We blame food. We blame sports. We blame everything on our upbringing. We blame loved ones for our unhappiness. And of course, we blame the physical body for letting us down. This may not be easy to admit. It may not seem easy to fix. But with a little insight, we can make a corrupt system impeccable again. We can respect ourselves for no reason and for every reason. We can become our own champion and best friend, refusing to suffer whatever the circumstance. Why does any human suffer? The problem is almost always leadership. Reliable leaders take care of their country, their body, first. Aware leaders will not believe the lies they tell themselves. Effective leaders don't submit to fear or intimidation. The mind leads because we allow it to lead. We believe in the character it created and allow it to speak on our behalf. We believe its opinions and its recollections. But me does not represent the truth. The mind cannot duplicate the truth. Truth is pure energy. Becoming aware of ourselves as energy or truth is an important revelation. The mind will continue to talk, sounding for all the world like a knowledgeable friend. But we don't have to believe it. We can rise above the voice of me at any time. Me is the point of view of life's reflection. It is an artificial intelligence. Life's information is filtered through all the thoughts and characteristics we've given ourselves. The main character has its own intelligence, but every me is different, depending on the development of the brain and the circumstances that affect the physical body. Each of us identifies with that character, so we find it difficult to separate me from reality. So it follows that we allowed me to rule without any interference. The Commander-in-Chief By trying to answer the question, who am I? You can begin to discern who you are not. You are not your body, but you are the guardian of its welfare and integrity. You are not the stories you tell about yourself. You are not the main character of those stories, but you believe you are so completely that you are sometimes willing to defend its point of view with your life. You are not your mind, but you are responsible for the message it delivers to your body. You are also responsible for the message it delivers through your body to the rest of humanity. 
your mind has learned to operate like a government composed of three branches. It has a congress that makes up laws. A judicial branch enforces those laws through a system of rewards and punishments similar to the methods your family and community used to domesticate you. In this chapter we will cover the executive branch and the president in charge of making decisions. First, let's understand that the leader of your own nation is not real. The one who rules your little government is something out of your imagination, but nevertheless has the power to affect your world. So what kind of leader do you want to be? Remember, you can't give what you don't have. If you want to be more compassionate, you must treat yourself with compassion. If you want to represent the truth to others, stop lying to yourself. If you want to love someone in the truest sense, love yourself without conditions. As with any government, the mind needs to make decisions that serve the body. The mind's addictions become the body's addictions, and so we should all stop making excuses to suffer. Whether the physical body is healthy or sick, it needs a trustworthy caretaker. It can't flourish when it's being punished beyond reason. It needs comfort, not criticism. It needs messages of delight, not doom. It needs to laugh. Responsible leaders rule fairly. Wise commanders know the power they wield over other minds and hearts, and they use that power carefully. They are aware of imbalances and prejudices within their administration. Without conscious leadership, the entire country suffers. Consider what kind of leader you are, or want to be, and consider the people your leadership will affect on a daily basis. If we want to preside over this body, our country, more wisely than what we have been doing, we need to give our governing style a fair assessment. We need to be honest with ourselves, admit our mistakes and be willing to change. All three branches of government need to be accountable for the happiness of the human being. If we're unwilling to pay attention to our personal evolution, the body will continue to pay a price. The main character of our story, me, wants to preside over everything. The problem, of course, is that me has long been a victim. Me feels persecuted by the system or judged by society. Me is forever on the defensive. And so how can me be a strong leader? How can me be an impartial judge? In the same way, me could be perpetually angry or resentful. If me is constantly critical, how can it work harmoniously with other branches of government? If me is a judge and a bully, how can it achieve the wisdom necessary to guide a nation? How do informal agreements get made between leaders, and how do treaties get approved? For many people, a victim has been acting as commander-in-chief of their country's armed forces. That puts the whole country at risk. What is a victim? For many people, a victim has been acting as commander-in-chief of their country's armed forces. That puts the whole country at risk. What is a victim? Someone who complains all the time. Someone who sees personal injustice everywhere and insists on being treated fairly. Clearly, there's nothing fair about one individual wanting the benefit of everyone's attention. There's no justice in a system ruled by one person's needs with little concern for the needs of others. When we think we're victimized, we become unreasonable. When we're insecure, small battles grow into major conflicts. When war breaks out, who pays the ultimate price? The body does, and it's hard to generate happiness again. We feel physically assaulted and dispirited simply because of what we believe to be true. Spirit means life, and life is the truth of what we are. We are spiritually mature when we are in close relationship with life, when we can tell the real from the unreal. 
Wonderful relationships can't happen when we're obsessed with me and all the things that concern me. Peace won't happen as long as we're waging wars within us and around us. Our bodies feel the stress and anxiety we create by constantly being a victim or a judge. This makes it especially important to consider the way that we lead, how we legislate, how we execute decisions, and how we choose our punishments. Our bodies feel the abuses first, but they aren't the only ones. How do we treat all the citizens of our nation, those who work with us, live with us, and depend on us? We can be an example of what bad governing does to good human beings, or we can show them what it takes to live functional, happy lives. Physical development is built into our biological blueprint, but spiritual evolution needs our attention and our will. How the main character tells its story affects the mood of the country and its closest allies. Humans are social animals and the mind mirrors our need for other bodies. In other words, it likes to connect with other minds. It sets up strongholds and other dreams by sending its best ambassadors, words and ideas. It sets up embassies in other people's realities, claiming a little bit of influence for itself. Once we inhabit space in other people's minds, it's tempting to interfere in their business. We might question their culture, overlooking the fact that we are in their world, not ours. The positive effect we have on people is a result of our respect for their traditions and beliefs. Peace is a result of honouring the way other humans do things, without imposing our laws on them. We all want peace. We all want to feel that our world is safe. We want to feel secure. And we want to feel proud of ourselves. It's funny how we love to praise the country we live in, but have never learned to praise the body that serves as a home to us. Our physical body is an extension of who we are. It houses our mind. It is home to the infinite energy that runs through us. Are we proud of that? Are we willing to protect it, even above our favourite opinions? When you travel, you may find that people of other cultures like to hear you describe your country. It feels good to tell them about its natural beauty and its many freedoms. Listen to what you tell people about your body as you go through an ordinary day. Do you talk about it with love and respect, or with derision? What about its leadership? Does it inspire or intimidate? Is it sane? generous and able to rise above its own story? Does it make people feel safe? How proud are you of the body that offers so many privileges? The leader of your country is the one who is perceiving and describing everything. The one reading these words is the main character of your story. You are the president of your own nation and you submit to all the rules you've put in place based on what you've observed in your lifetime. You can see that you're the one that who creates and enforces the rules, whether they seem fair or not. Your influence goes as far as your words go. Your command is as strong as your personal authority. If you're able to see how your nation is run, you may also notice that everyone around you is the leader of their own nation. Your mother is a government of her own. Your father, your siblings and your friends are ruled by their own governments. You seek opportunities to participate in those governments. The government is influenced by the conversations of its people. The ideas that we send by texting, talking, singing or filming go into other minds. Our ambassadors reach other nations and we receive ambassadors from other nations. We all have influence on our governments, just as we have influence on our families, tribes and cities. Together we influence humanity and the equilibrium of life on earth. Being aware of that kind of power 
should encourage us to use it responsibly. Humans can't control the planet, but they can hurt it. As president, we can't actually control the body we live in, but we can hurt it. We can't stop the body from getting old or sick, but we can injure it through our actions, reactions and neglect. We can sedate it or intoxicate it. We can poison and corrupt it. And we do. Corruption, once again, is the problem. Truth is the solution. What is truth? The truth cannot be explained with words. In fact, words take us farther from the truth, creating a reality of their own. What is truth? The truth cannot be explained with words. In fact, words take us farther from the truth, creating a reality of their own. However, we all know instinctively that there is more to us than words and theories. We were whole before we learned a language. We can feel whole again without relying on symbols to speak for us. Words are our emissaries, but again, they are not the truth of us. Close your eyes and you can feel energy moving through you. You can feel it running under your skin, making it warm. Notice your breath, your heartbeat, your flickering eyelids. Move your fingers, your legs, your head, and feel the power that commands every motion. That power is life, flowing into all the little universes of you. Every emotion is real, every sensory perception is telling you the truth. The thoughts that manipulate your emotions are not real. What you are is pure energy, the force of life. Nothing else is real. The mind is a mirror reflection of the truth and the mirror merely attempts to represent what is real. The reflection is only as good as the quality of the mirror. Life's energy is real. It is what you are, what we all are. We don't have to prove our worth. We forget that, thinking we have to fight for recognition and then fight to maintain it. We fight for attention. We fight over ideas and personal opinions at the expense of our emotional health. We fight to understand ourselves and we fight to be understood. Life is truth and it doesn't need to be understood. Truth doesn't need proof or even faith to survive. And it doesn't need our stories. Truth existed before stories, before humanity, and truth will continue after all the storytellers are gone. We don't need a thought or a theory to show us the truth. Truth can be felt in our loving and in our enduring passion to live. If we understand how we govern ourselves, we can create a more benevolent government. We can change the temperament of its leader. Most of us are intimidated by power, but eager to use power against ourselves. We can see violence everywhere, but not the kind of violence we inflict on our own bodies. We've tortured it to make it thinner, stronger or more attractive. We've been unkind to the body, often trying to control its natural impulses. Seeing that, we can change. The human body has served us loyally, and it deserves loyalty in return. We imagine that life looks upon us favourably or treats us badly, but life is what we are. Our minds can imagine so many things, so imagine how the mind can conspire with life. Imagine giving up control in this moment and surrendering to life. Imagine going through a day without having to be me. 
Using a little bit of imagination, we can govern ourselves in new ways and come up with solutions to recurring problems. After all, imagining and problem solving are what the mind does best. We're all in the process of creating the reality we think we deserve and each of us has defined the central character. Each of us sees the world through the eyes of me and me is on autopilot, making rules and executing them without full awareness. Like all great stories, your personal story could use a hero. Your body could use a savior. As it happens, the only one who can save you is the main character of your story. The one you call me is not real, but it affects real things. Rather than perceiving the truth, most of us yield to an inner voice. We listen to our own thoughts. We believe them and we obey them at the expense of our happiness. We focus on past conversations, past moments, past years. It may have taken time and patience to learn those habits, but they can be undone with far less effort. We have the tools. We have attention, memory and imagination to guide us forward. If me is the problem, me is also the solution. Your country already has a leader who wants to be wise and compassionate. If you're asking life's deeper questions, you may already be a president who's prepared to put the welfare of the country first. You have a legislature that wants to revise its laws and a justice system that re respects all individuals. You can sense what is real and what is not. You're ready to take the next step. Change requires action. One action leads to another and another until new habits become automatic and change becomes evident. In time, people's reactions change and they see you differently. There's no need to look at other governments for solutions. You have all you need to build a healthy and prosperous nation. You have the will and you have the awareness. So if what we call reality is virtual and me is not real, then what about the world around us? What else actually isn't real? What are the pearls of wisdom have we overlooked?